Hello and welcome to Glasgow in 2024 Presents. My name is Esther McCallum-Stewart and I'm the chair of the Glasgow in 2024 Worldcon bid and I'm really excited to be introducing you to our online events. I hope you enjoy this event <clears throat> and if you do why not take a moment to see what else we have coming up online at glasgow2024.org. All of our events are broadcast live but if you want to watch or listen again you can find them all online at our YouTube channel. Please feel free to join in the conversation on social media. We'll be using the hashtag, hashtag G in 2024 across Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And you can also find us there at, at Glasgow in 2024. If you would like to become a supporter of the bid, you can do so at glasgow2024.org slash pre-support. Or if you want to volunteer to get involved, then please check out our volunteer page on our website. We can't currently be together, but we do hope we can bring a little bit of the Glasgow 2024 spirit and joy to you wherever you are in the world. Enjoy the event and thank you. Hi everyone, I'm really sorry to say this. Um, our host's internet has gone off just now and hopefully she'll be back to join us very quickly. Um, we're just going to get our participants, um, Anne and Farah, to un, um, unmute themselves, un reveal themselves again, um, and hopefully Marita will be able to join us very quickly. I think it's cursed. I think she has she has a COVID curse from a vaccine has actually infected her internet rather than no. just her own feverish state. So. Um, I will I will kind of be here in the quiet in the background. Could you both introduce yourselves to us? Hello, my name is Anne Vandermeer. I am an editor and an anthologist. I am probably best known for doing gigantic large anthologies, but I also do small ones. Oh, and I love cats. That is so wonderful to see your cat. Um, I am definitely a cat lover. I live with Neo. You might have heard of him. He is the one. Um, but in addition to the anthologies, I'm also an editor for Tor.com, and I was the editor of Weird Tales magazine back in the day, for, for which I won a Hugo. So that's pretty much my story. I am an editor. I'm a reader. I'm a lover of stories and cats. Well, I'm Farah Mendelssohn, although I suspect you're much more interested in Freddie Mercury over there. Um, he will probably disappear now. I was an academic. I have edited nonfiction and I've also edited a couple of fiction anthologies and I review and I'm rather passionate about the short story form, although way behind as always. There's never enough time to do all the reading. Uh, will that do? Yes. That, no, that, that's, that, that's wonderful. Now, um, I, guys, everybody who's witnessing here it's, it's clearly going to be one of those uh, one of those days for Glasgow um I think we're each of you going to do a bit of a reading a little bit of a share could we maybe start with that to allow time for Marita to be yeah Anne was going to do a reading and I was going to talk about a, a project I used to set my students which was about anthologizing so Anne why don't you go for it first okay well I I am actually going to read part of the story the, I'm going to duck out and leave you to it <laughs> I, I was going to start off by reading a part of a story that I think is a great introduction into talking about stories. And so let me read this. This is from the story, The Will of the Wisps Are in Town by Hans Christian Andersen. There was a man who once had known a great many fairy tales, but he had forgotten them, he said. The fairy tale that used to come to visit him no longer came and knocked at his door. And why didn't it come anymore? It's true that for a year and a day, the man hadn't thought of it, hadn't really expected it to come and knock. And it certainly wouldn't have come anyway, for outside there was war, and inside the misery and sorrow that war brings with it. I wonder if it will ever come back and knock again. And he remembered so vividly all the various forms in which it had come to him, sometimes as young and charming as spring itself, as a beautiful maiden 
with a thyme wreath in her hair and a birch branch in her hand, her eyes shining as clear as the deep woodland lakes in the bright sunshine. Sometimes the fairy tale had come to him in the likeness of a peddler and had opened its pack and let the silver ribbons inscribed with old verses flutter out. But it had been best of all when it had come as an old grandmother with silvery hair and such large and kindly eyes. She knew so well the tales of the old, old times of even long before the princesses spun with golden spindles and the dragons, the serpents lay outside guarding them. Will she ever knock at my door again, said the man. That was perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and I apologize, everyone. Uh, my internet just decided to completely turn itself off. Uh, I think it's the microchip in my vaccine, something like that. Uh, thank you very much. That was that was beautiful. Um, that is in um, Big Book of Classic Fantasy, right? Yes, that's from the Big Book of Classic Fantasy. Perfect. Uh, so. Uh, we shall uh, move on to, I think, uh, Farah, you have an exercise for us? It's not an exercise, but I wanted to just talk about this exercise because it produced some of the best critical work from students I've ever received. And I'm going to say, first of all, I apologize to the young man who was interviewing for a job who gave me this idea that I cannot remember his name. OK, and, and what he did wasn't quite what I'm going to describe, but it just struck me at the time that it was so interesting. Um, his assignment was that simply he got students to select items for a reader. What I decided to do was to set for students the challenge to essentially construct an anthology of short stories they had read. The course itself was taught using predominantly first the Wesleyan anthology and later on uh, the Vandermeer anthology, which I'm sure most of you have come across uh, and can remind me of the title. I can't remember what it was called. Big book. Big book. The big book of science fiction. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and they were only allowed to use three stories we'd done in class. Oh, and somebody's saying they did it for that module. Hi, Tam. Um, and what they then had to do, having selected 10 short stories, was they had to write a critical introduction to those short stories. They could pick any theme they wanted. It could be thematic, it could be country-based. Had a superb piece from a young man who went to do his MA at Durham on Arab science fiction at a time when we didn't actually have a collection of Arab science fiction available in English. Uh, some people did it on stylistics, on a particular way of writing, but the result was 2,000 word essays, just hugely more interesting, thoughtful, and wide ranging than almost any other work I'd received from undergraduates. And it really showed me the degree to which anthologizing is, is a critical exercise. It's not just about putting together your favorite stories. It is about thinking about why these stories, what is it they share? What do they show us about each, about every other story by the existence of that story in the text? So as we start talking about anthologies, I hope we're going to start pushing at some of those ideas, what it is you, you, you achieve when you construct an anthology, what you're trying to achieve, what you want the reader to get out of it. And I'm getting applause from that particular item. <laughs> which is really nice. I loved marking them. It made for some of the best marking I've ever done. I am a rare academic, by the way. I actually like marking. There you go, I'm weird. I've not been allowed to do any marking yet, but once I have an opinion, I will update on that. Um, that actually um, is wonderful to hear because it, it's sort of one of the reasons why um, I was so excited for us to mm. have this conversation and have um, that uh, creative perspective and that academic perspective is that too often when we talk about um, historicizing fantasy and, and the canon, we tend to focus on the novels and leave aside the short stories. And many times this, 
the image that comes from history of novels is very different from history of short stories, um, which is sort of uh, something that I wanted to uh, bring up with both of you. What has your experience been and working on those those two uh, egg books, um, literally and <laughs> title, so um, how has the way that you view the sort of the, the history of fantasy changed after working on those projects? Well, I think that the first thing that I noticed is when we were working on classic fantasy, there wasn't really so much of a division back then with short fiction, when short fiction was coming out, there wasn't there wasn't these categories like there are now. So a writer could write whatever they wanted to write without having to think about what part of the bookstore it's going to be stuck in, that type of thing. And um, that's definitely a big shift from what I saw with modern fantasy, especially with the rise of a lot of magazines that were coming out after, um, you know, in the, in the um, later part of the 20th century. But with classic, if you think about it though, a lot of um, storytelling, the earliest storytelling was in more of a fantastical mode and it was never thought of as being inferior to any other type of storytelling. It wasn't until modern days, I would say maybe from the 50s on to the present time, that there was this kind of ghettoization of what we would call speculative fiction or fantasy fiction or science fiction. And um, it, it's, it's sad and I, I don't like to see those divisions. What, what I try to do in all of the projects that, that I work on is to open it up and make it wider and more encompassing. And rather than trying to exclude things, I try to see how do things how can things be included and does it make sense to do that? So I'm more interested in looking at a story for what the story is and does it fit my vague general description of what a fantasy story is? And for the purposes of the anthologies that we were working on in the big books of classic and modern, we were looking at a sense of the unreal in in encompassing the real world, something happening in the real world that's that's fantastical, or in another sense, a story that takes place in a secondary world, a world that's not of our own. And in those stories, they don't necessarily have to have anything supernatural or fantastical happen. It just has to be a different place other than our real world. So those were the kinds of things that we were looking at when we were working on Big Book. And what's what's really interesting is that that Originally, we wanted to do it as one, one book, and then we're like, mm, can't be done. We need two big books. And even with two big books, there's still a whole lot more we could have done. And you think when you have 750, 800 pages, maybe even up to 1,000 pages, that you're going to run out of things to go in there. But there's always, always stories that I wish we could have included, but we just didn't have the space, believe it or not. No, I, I can I can believe that quite easily. Uh, and for the record, all, both of them together is about 16,000. 16, yeah. Uh, no, 16,000. 1,600. 1,600, yes. I make that um, mistake all the time. So, in my defense, they are double uh, double columns. So, <laughs> yeah, um, Farah. So what I'd really point to is that if you look at fantasy before the 1930s, I'd say, there isn't necessarily, I, I, I agree with what I'm saying about there's no distinction within the market between the fantastic and the non-fantastic in terms of respect, but there are real differences between what gets published at book length and what gets published at short story length. Most early fantasy tends to be this world, what we now probably call weird fantasy, and we only really start seeing quirky, slick, modern, um, urban type fantasy, really in the 1930s in the magazines. And I think they come out almost of the crime fiction genre. They come from the hacks. And, and I don't mean hack as a pejorative. I mean, mm -hmm. hack as a term for people who wrote in multiple genres. And you can often see writers 
weird fiction writers are more likely to exist in the horror, fantasy, maybe science fiction nexus. The slick, quirky, urban fantasy writers where the devil comes to New York are more likely to be on the crime science fiction nexus. And what there's almost nothing of in that early period is secondary world, immersive, quest type fantasy. And even now I'd say that actually you see far less secondary world short stories than you do secondary world novels. I think it's one of those forms that by the time you've built your world, you don't have much time for story left. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you can't do it, but it's a lot less common. And certainly somewhere I've got a big book of quest fantasy short stories, and I think there's only 10 stories in it in 500 pages. Mm -hmm. Okay, at which point you have to start questioning what the word short means. So that I think there is a difference in what the, the short story can do in genre terms or is used for. Let's not say can do, because I really would prefer people went out and proved me wrong. Um, and I think that's interesting. And the other thing I would say is that in pre, let's say pre-2000 short stories, most of them still tend to have either the slingshot structure or the very neat quirky structure, everything comes together at the end. They are recognizably science fiction and fantasy forms, if that makes sense. They have a, they have a shape to them, which I can describe when I'm writing on paper because I can take it apart, but it's harder to describe verbally, but we all know it when we see it. There's, there's a neat sense of closure to them. Um, everything comes together at the end. I think that's kind of disappeared. When I was writing on this a few years back, I actually struggled to find modern stories that had those neat endings. So I think that's quite a shift in the, in the genre. Oh, Asimov had a word for it, shaggy dog. There used to be an awful lot of shaggy dog stories in fantasy, and I don't think you see anything like as many of them as before. I, I don't know whether Ad would agree with me. Now, why do you think that is, though? Why do you think that that shift has, has happened? Do you think the reading audience is not as interested in those stories that have those nice, neat little tied up endings, or they're looking for something different? I think it may actually be a convergence of literary forms. So just as once upon a time, fantasy and the mainstream weren't that separate. I think we're currently going through a period where fantasy and the mainstream aren't that separate. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who come into the field aren't coming in with that tradition of the magazine short story. They don't have that fixed idea of what the fantasy story should feel like. And I think that can only be good. It could very well be that. I know that um, when I've been teaching different mm -hmm. workshops for speculative fiction, I get a lot of students that are in um, um, and that are in master's programs throughout the, the country. And they are taking my workshop because they want to learn more about writing science fiction and fantasy when they're not getting it as much from the university's systems that they're in. And the work that they present is so interesting and unusual and they're not getting the respect in their programs, but they, they get it when they're published, which is really yes. quite interesting. So many of my students have gone on to have really good careers publishing their, their interesting, fantastical stories that maybe weren't as appreciated as some of the slice of life things that you might see coming out of um, these, um, these master's programs. I do think that fantasy is a space in which you can experiment with form. As a, as a field, we support that. Mm -hmm. And it goes in phases. Sometimes it's something authors take advantage of, sometimes it's not. But I think right now we're very definitely in a period where, where authors are doing that. They're really stretching. Um, so when I'm teaching, one of the, the classes is always on fantasy as form rather than fantasy as content. And I think we're seeing a lot of authors who are working with fantasy as form while not losing the element of the fantastic as content. I would agree with you there. And the other thing that I'm seeing a lot more of now is I'm seeing the influence of international writers as well. We are having the opportunity now to read a lot more works in translation than we ever have before. And when you read a work in translation, not only are you being introduced to these different stories from these different writers, 
but those stories also come with a cultural background. So you're learning more about that as well. So it's not just a matter of translating a story word to word to word, but yes. it's also being able to convey to the reader that might not have that background or context of the cultural um, beginnings from those stories, but, but the translator has to also keep in mind who the reading audience is and how do I translate this particular culture and activity and belief systems, et cetera, to these readers. And so I find that to be very, very interesting, especially when I'm in workshops and I see writers from different backgrounds bringing their stories in and other students critiquing, and they might not have an understanding of the backgrounds of the culture from where that story came from. So they are critiquing it from their, their perspective, not really seeing where that story came from and having an appreciation for it. So what I'm seeing more and more nowadays is people being able to read stories from different parts of the world and having an appreciation of the storytelling from those parts of the world as well. So in addition to the experimentation that fantasy lends itself to, it also opens it up to all these other different perspectives, which I find quite refreshing. And you're reminding me of something that I read only two days ago. It's a children's book. I can't remember the title or author. It may come back to me later. I'll look it up when we have a moment where I was actually struggling with the writing. I was thinking, hang on, but the grammar isn't correct. And I suddenly realized that that wasn't actually what was going on. What I was reading was a different English. And once I realized uh, the author is somebody from Hackney in London, and once I realized that what I was actually reading was absolutely British Caribbean English, which is a thing, everything just dropped into place and suddenly there was no problem reading it. And I was the one who had to make that shift in that this wasn't a translation. And right. to translate it would have been appalling. Uh, I, I used to teach in London and I was actually quite shocked how many of my students had been taught they couldn't use their own English to write fiction in. I'm sorry, you may need to learn the Queen's English to write academic prose. You do not need to use anything but your own language to write fiction. And making that shift, this book suddenly opened up and read incredibly easily. Mm -hmm. So in my own brain, it, it comes down to this, you can cope with dragons, you can cope with a different mode of English. Uh, but the fact that that, that that space is there is really important. And in terms of short stories, I do think it's a place where you could really push that. Mm -hmm. you know, you can, because you can hold an audience with radical experimentalism for the space of a short story where you can't for a full novel or let's not say can't. Okay, so this is a slightly different point, but I actually think magazine editors are generally more willing to go the extra mile to take that, I don't want to say risk, yeah, to take that risk, to be willing to say there is space for this. Um, so there's some really interesting stuff coming out there, I think. Somebody said, where is the work in Geordie? Write it. Well, it's I also the reason why, oh, I was Sorry, say, I think the reason why magazine editors might be more willing to take the risk of publishing different types of stories is that when they're doing that, it's part of a larger thing. So they can still get the readership coming for the thing that they're familiar with, the thing that's comfortable to them, but at the same time, they're able to introduce them to something new. And that's something that I love to do in my anthologies as well, is that that you'll see on the cover all of the familiar names that you're used to and you're comfortable with, but when you open up the book, you're introduced to a lot of different things. Now with novels, that's a completely different thing because an editor that's buying a novel for their publishing company, that book stands by itself. And so how do you get people to pick up that book? It's much easier to get them to pick up a magazine or an anthology, but to get them to pick up a book from a writer they've never heard of and that maybe it's a bit of a challenge when they first get into it. Because one of the things that I find, what you were talking about, Farah, when you're reading a different kind of English, an English that you're not used to, what I find myself doing is I get myself into the mode and when I start getting into the rhythm of the language, 
the beauty of it just opens up for me, but I have to have the time to do that. It's not something that I can sit down and do in five minutes. So I challenge readers to pick up something like that, that might be out of their comfort zone, something they've never experienced before, and let, let them get into the rhythm of the language and let it just kind of envelop you. I'm looking at some of the comments online about this, and I do wonder if the very nature of being an anthology editor makes one both more adventurous and more aware of just how diverse and wide ranging and willing to give things a go readers are. Because the book market for all, I'm seeing people saying, yes, we don't underestimate readers. It's easy to forget we are, as a, as a body of people, active readers who go out to search lots of new things. But there are plenty of readers out there who do just want more of the same to the right. point of, uh, one of one of these days I actually want to write something on the mono reader, the, and I have met them, all they read is an author. It may be Robert Jordan, it may be John R. Martin or Neil Gaiman, it never seems to be a woman, but they read one person. So there's a whole spread of types of reader. But when you're an editor for an anthology, on one level to start with, you know you are targeting yourself at adventurous readers. So that creates all this space to be adventurous. I, I just think that I'm lucky to be able to do this work. <laughs> just think about it. I mean, what brought me into editing to begin with is that I just love to read. And I'm one of those people that when I find something that I love, I just wanna share with everybody. And so becoming an editor just seemed to be a natural course for me because I have no talent for writing. You know, I and actually, I, um, I wrote a book when I was eight years old and I, I illustrated it too. It was, it was written and illustrated by me and it was called Going to Grandma's House. And that was like the peak of my writing abilities. That's like, I knew I could never do any better, but I love to read and I love to talk about books. So that's how I became an editor. And, and to me, being able to put together these anthologies, being able to work with writers when they're starting out, being able to read original fiction and bring it to the world. I mean, I, I just feel like, I am so lucky it's the best job in the world. That and cat wrangling, two things. That and cat wrangling. But they're very I mean, similar. I should say I'm in the same position. I'm not a fiction writer. I've never even particularly wanted to be a fiction writer. Every bit of fiction I've ever written was because somebody told me I had to write some fiction. Um, I much, much prefer reading, critiquing, thinking things through. It, it, I'm not a writer. Um, I guess somebody else was saying they, they wrote and illustrated a book. Actually, that's more than I ever managed. I didn't even write as a child. Where should we go with this topic? <laughs> um, I was going to say when I was, uh, this is a, a thing all three of us have in common. When I was doing my, my fantasy, I'm led, I think I was the only one in the entire course that was not a writer. <laughs> uh, People never so believe a... you. People never believe you. <laughs> So um, we have started getting um, some questions from the audience. If you'd like, um, we can start talking about those. Um, I apologize that I'm now on my phone because my internet just keeps keeps breaking on us. Um, the microchip, I can't do anything about it. So we can see um, you beautifully. Thank you. So we have a question from um, Elaine. Um, who's calling back to um, what Anne mentioned earlier about the genre closing in on speculative fiction in the 50s. And Elaine says that the uh, Iowa, Iowa Writers Iowa Workshop writers. <laughs> yes, was sponsored by the CIA about that time to promote what became the predominant lit fic. There was a student at Glasgow doing research on that now. Um, and uh, Elaine's asking for thoughts about that and might the rise of that specific capitalism friendly genre have crowded out the more speculative of speculative fiction? Well, I, I can't speak to the background of the Iowa Writers Workshop because I don't really have any knowledge of that. But I, I do know that one of the things that I see a lot with the MFA programs here in this country in the United States is that it produces a lot of writers that seem to write very similar types of stories. And I almost feel like in, in, in some ways, it's almost like the edges have been, been um, sanded off 
And that's not true of all of them. I mean, I, I don't want to just make a blanket statement saying they're all that way, but but there seems to be so many writers that go through these um, these MFA mm -hmm. programs and what's coming out and what I see in a lot of the uh, the uh, literary journals, it's, it's almost like the same kind of story over and over again. And that's one of the things that I think is why a lot of writers are exploring more speculative, fantastical types mm -hmm. of stories, because it's just more interesting. And so I do see more and more of them coming to that. And I also see, not as much as I'd like to, but I do see a lot of creative writing programs in universities here starting to maybe take a closer look at it. Some places they actually embrace it. I've seen programs that embrace it wholeheartedly and I think that that's wonderful. But I also feel like a writer needs to write whatever story that writer is gonna write. And they shouldn't be constrained whether it's going to be a realistic tale or a spec tale. They just need to write what's in their heart. That's the best story they're gonna write. So again, like Anne, I can't comment on the specifics, but the tension between the fantastic and the mundane, and again, I'm, I'm using it in a non-pejorative sense, has definitely been with us since the end of the 19th century. And it's been very, very connected to notions of adulthood, that what you should do when you grow up is give up childish things. You should kick off your silver slippers and you should settle down to domesticity. And the 1950s, particularly in America, all, all of value is centered around the family. All of value is centered around the domestic. And the reaction to that in the 1960s, which produced some fantastic science fiction, affected literary fiction slightly differently in that you got what I think I'd call the Middletown angst. And I, I don't know if any of our people following this talk will know about Middletown, but it's the study of Middletown, Connecticut was a study, and I can't remember who the authors were, was a social study of an ordinary town. And it was very much American, white, lower middle class suburbia. And what it revealed was in fact what Betty Friedan later found out, which was that actually everybody was hating this domesticity. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that that then fed into a literature that was about hating your life. And an awful lot of what emerged at that point as literary fiction, I think a lot of us would call angst fiction. Um, it's about angsting. It's very internal. Very little happens in it. And that contrasts quite strongly with, I won't say all, but the general tenor of science fiction and fantasy, which, are, which tend to be much more externalized. Now, the place where this clashes, and I have ranted about this in one of my books, is in YA fiction, where the turn to the use of a very introverted first person often clashes with the external, go, go down a mountain in a skateboard, attitude of science fiction and fantasy. And you can often get these books that, that don't quite feel like science fiction because instead of talking about how they're going to interact with the aliens, they angst about the fact they've broken up with their boyfriend or girlfriend or dog friend or whatever while the alien war is going on. And I know they're popular and I don't have a problem with people liking them. I don't want to start dissing on what people like but it's an interesting area where you can see the two types of fiction, the, the literary angst internal response fiction, which is very much about the emotional response to the world, try to work with the kind of fiction which is about what you're going to do to the world or what is the world going to do to you. Uh, I, one day I would like to think more about that. So there's a tension there that I think is interesting. That is very interesting. Although I will say, you know, um, after a year and a half of lockdowns and quarantine, uh, arguing with a boyfriend or girlfriend is pretty much science fiction for me. So, you know, <laughs> at least there's that. <laughs> um, it's not about arguing about with a boyfriend or girlfriend. It's about that's all you think about in your introverted first. Okay, here's what I mean. <laughs> if you look at first person in novels for any age group before about 1990 that I did this I did that but if you look at a lot of modern YA and not all of it 
it's I think that or I felt that and it's a shift from the outward observation to the internal visceral feeling and it's a different relationship with the world and it's one that I've previously associated much more with literary fiction than with science fiction and none of that is to say that you can't have internalizing in science fiction but there's pardon me there's something going on there and I'm not quite sure what it is but yeah, I have the to phenomenologists say, would have a lot to say about that <laughs> All of that's the... so interesting how many adults read YA and love it, unapologetically read YA. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think, um, I don't know what the statistics are on the number of, of adult readers versus um, teenagers that are reading YA fiction, but there's quite a, a lot of my girlfriends read it. It's enough to, do, to cause problems on the blog sites. So one of the points made by a lot of younger YA bloggers is that older readers can afford to buy the books when they come straight out. And they go and they put their comments on Goodreads and they're creating response to the book that isn't actually the target readership response. I mean, wow. I read a ton of YA, um, but I, I would say that I tend to go for what I would call the much more bitter YA, the stuff that, that Francis Harding is my absolute favourite, but Franny Billingsley, Patrice Kendall, the stuff where really unpleasant stuff happens and nobody has time to have a, a relationship because really nasty stuff is happening. Uh, and people are saying here they all regularly read it. And the pawn point somebody's made, is it because everyone is living at home for longer? We're having career, less, fewer careers at an early age. I've made this point in one of my books. A better term for fiction for young readers is school age fiction. And you can actually see it following up it, it expands with the gradually increasing school leaving age, which for many middle class kids is now around 25. Um, <laughs> so if you look at fiction from the 1950s, when people talk about it being implausible, they completely forget the kids it's targeted at are expecting to leave school and go to work at 15. You know, mm. it's a very different market from the modern market. It's not that teens were different, it's that the expectations of them are different. So there are those issues as well. But also, I think most of us are in the category of if it's a good book, we'll read it. We don't care who it was True. written for. True. And what's what's really interesting is that since we started the shutdown, it's been over a year now because we shut down in Florida um, at the beginning of March last year. I started doing a daily grandma story time with my grandchildren. And one of them lives in Amsterdam and two of them are, are in LA. And so I had to find a time period where we could, and the age group I was doing from 10 to 15 years old. So I had to find books that those kids would enjoy all together. And we, we're still doing it. <laughs> um, the LA boys have dropped out. So I've just got my um, Dutch grandson who's reading with me. And we're reading a lot of interesting books and I never read ahead, but I have to tell you, there was this one book that I read. It's called The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. I don't know if you oh, all have read this book. book. And I'm reading this book to my grandsons, and I get to this certain point in the book, and I just burst into tears. Now, is this a book that I would have picked up on my own had I not been reading it to my grandchildren? Probably not. But now I want to read everything that T.J. Klune has written. So it's one of those kind of things. And, it, yeah. and I'm reading a lot. And I, then I read, I, I've read all of the Miss Peregrine's Peculiar Children books because they love those books. So I'm reading all these books and I, I'm finding it quite interesting how I'm engaging with these stories and how I can't wait until story time when I can read the next chapter and see what happens because I'm being very good and I'm not reading ahead. <laughs> oh, now Fiona Moore's just mentioned that teenagers like books about older adults. And they like reading books, well, and not even just teens, they like reading books that are written for adults. And again, if we're to come back to anthologies, this is where anthologies are vital. I know that a lot of my introduction to science fiction was via a series called Out of This World by Amabel Williams Ellis, which were held in all British libraries, as far as I could tell when I was a kid. Right? Every, wherever you were, you could find these books. And the key thing about them is that what they anthologized were just short stories from the magazines. Mm -hmm. They were packaged for children, but they weren't children's children fiction. Stories. Mm -hmm. And that introduced me to all the, what I now know as the big names. And, and the re for those who aren't British or have never come across these, the reason they were held in British libraries 
is that they had an introduction by Bertrand Russell and therefore were labelled respectable. You can find them anywhere. There was about 12 of them, I think, and they're so good. So the anthology is a lovely way of getting into a field. When I was teaching, it's quite normal for most courses on science fiction and fantasy to set novels. And I got fed up with doing it because you can only ever set about 10. And the problem is that that doesn't introduce students to the range of style and subgenre in the field. It just doesn't. It's not like teaching crime fiction where there's the cozy, there's the noir, there's, you know, there are some very clear subgenres and there's only about six of them and you can cover them all. You cannot do that in science fiction and fantasy. But by handing them an anthology, well, we could do three stories a week which meant we could do at least 30, plus the exercise I gave them meant they had to read at least another seven. And so when you give somebody an anthology, you can give them this massive range in a field. And I used to count my score rate, how many of my students who had been forced to do the course because they'd run out of any other choices and insisted in, in the first class that they hated SF and fantasy were converts by the end. And there were always at least two or three. And part of that was because their idea of what fantasy was, was awfully narrow. Mm -hmm. It was what they had seen in the movies, which tend to be quest fantasies or tend to be really quirky things like big fish, for example. They had no idea that there were all these different things out there. So for me, I'm rambling, but I, I just, I, one of the reasons I love anthologies is just that variety. No, that's that's absolutely um, absolutely my my experience as well, and I think a lot of a lot of people's experience. And it brings us very neatly to a couple of more technical questions that we've gotten. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's mainly um, one one I think is for for both of you, and then I have one that is going to be mainly for Anne, but also for you, Farah, for your experience with with teaching and anthologies and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Robin asks, uh, do you have a view on the optimum length or number of stories in an anthology? Like, what is too long? What is too short? And obviously, we're not counting the big books in that, because I think the big books are a bit Spider-George and would alter mm. the results. I, this isn't optimum, but I do find that more than 12 stories and I've often put the anthology down before I've finished it. And then I have to go back and finish it later. Whereas 12 stories, I can read more or less at a sitting. So for me, I'd say, if we're not talking one of the big teaching anthologies, a nice, neat collection of 12 stories. But I need to emphasize here, and Anne and I were arguing online about this beforehand. I don't like big books. I don't like big novels. My idea of the perfect length for a novel is 60,000 words, 90 at a stretch. Um, I'm not saying I haven't read bigger novels, but I, I won't mention the author. I was watching my partner read somebody's novel, a very big name, night after night after night. And after, by the seventh night, he was a fifth of the way in. And I just looked at him and said, you realise you've got two sequels to that one? And he looked at it, looked at me and put the book down. Um, I like, I think there's a, diff this goes back to, there are people who like a story to keep going. I like lots of stories. And I like lots of anthologies. I like that taste in lots of different things. Yeah, no, um, I think that's, that's a fair answer. And what about you? Well, I think you can't really say what's the optimum, optimal length of an anthology because every anthology is different now. It's true mm -hmm. that I've done a lot of big books with my husband, but not all of the anthologies I've done are big. Um, I, when my husband and I did Sisters of the Revolution, um, spec lick, uh, um, feminist spec lick, you know, that was a much smaller book. And of course it was much more of a challenge because I didn't have as much space to be able to, to put everything in there. So I think that every single project you approach you're gonna approach differently because they're gonna have different goals and aims. When we do the big books, we want to be as inclusive as we possibly can. And we also want, in all of the projects that I've ever done, I wanna make sure that I leave the reader hungry for more. Even in the big books, mm -hmm. Vera, I wanna make sure that 
they're reading something and that leads them to something else that they did not know about. So that's always important to me. I do not expect in the big books for a reader to sit down and start on page one and read all the way through. That's typically not what a reader is going to do. Some do, but I, I think most readers are gonna skip around. They're gonna look for the names that they recognize or maybe something that looks interesting that piques their interest and that's fine. I don't have an expectation that someone's going to read all of it, especially reviewers. But you know, if, if they pick up a story and they're interested in that author, I would hope that maybe they seek out that author's other work. Also, what I try to do in those anthologies is to lay out who was influenced by who, so that if you're reading a story that you really love and you know that that writer was influenced by someone who's not in the book, maybe you're gonna go look at their work too, because that's something that I found doing the research in putting these anthologies together as I found a lot other work that I was interested in, in reading that maybe it didn't fit for whatever reason. So to me, even the big ones, I consider them to be almost like introductions and an opening of a conversation that I hope will continue. So I want to throw in something slightly different here that I only realized because I've commuted most of my working life but in different ways. I've done three hour commutes from York to Reading. I have commuted on coaches. I've commuted on the London Underground, on buses and on trains. And I discovered that each time what I read shifted. And it made me start to realize that one of the things we don't talk about, about the publishing industry, is how much it's shaped by where and when people read. Uh, so just to throw one thing out, when um, Kindles or Kindle equivalents came along, to a lot of people's surprise, there was a very sharp rise in people buying short stories off the internet. And it's because so many people commute that actually, oh, I've got a train to catch, I'll just download something about the length of my journey. And I, I started doing it and I was fascinated. I started checking this out. So as Anne was talking, I realized an awful lot of what I like is conditioned by the fact that as a child, I wanted a paperback I could stick in the, my back pocket mm -hmm. or a book that could go in. So this is just a silly story. I got my first Anne McCaffrey for, as a present for not reading through my dad's wedding. Okay, why did I not read through my dad's wedding? Because my mother had stopped me at the door and taken out the perfect clutch purse sized paperback I was carrying. <laughs> Because she knew I would if I got the chance. So when I think about what size the perfect book is, part of what I mean isn't just the reading of it, but the carrying of it. And mm -hmm. that's something that the e-reader has definitely changed. I'm much more willing to read a big book that I can put on my e-reader than I am one that I have to haul around. So yeah. there's, there's interesting things there as well. Well, this is you say that because whenever I travel, when I used to travel, when I would get on a plane, I would go to the stack of books to be read and I would go like this to see which one is the lightest. <laughs> exactly. That's the one I'll take with me. Oh, and I, I used to go into the bookshop and you could get very, very cheap copies of classics with, on very thin paper. And I would buy 10 and dump them as I read. Um, mm -hmm. Just just yeah. to get rhythm, but yes. Or I would go through and look for second copies of things because we're hopeless at purging here. Absolutely hopeless. But there is, if you took them with you, then you didn't bring them back and that was fine. Um, I've yes. done that. A bag this has is to my... be big enough for a book. Oh, there's one. Somebody's saying, you don't choose your book to your bag, you pick your bag for your book. <laughs> <laughs> this was my, my constant, um, my constant trouble is that they've now started making the paperbacks very big. And yes. I understand that from a sort of, um, you know, uh, making it easier to read and um, publishing quality and stuff like that. But I always sort of, and this is right here, so I'll just bring it out. I have a copy of an early edition of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which is not a small yes. book. Mm -mm, However, no. the paperback that I have is literally smaller than my head and the letters are tiny and it's about oh. a, over a thousand pages, but it's perfect carrying size. I've never met a book uh, as a physical object that I've loved more. 
and it's so much that how much you can take it with you and sort of you know um carry it along um anyway so uh i will just i'm taking us through um more questions uh, so that one is mainly uh, for Anne, and it's from Dimitra on uh, Facebook. You sort of uh, talked about it a little bit already, but is, um, can you talk us through the process of putting together a fantasy anthology? Is the theme the main focus? Is it the starting point? Is the sort of ambassadorial role of introducing new writers or themes more important to you? Um, so if you just... Well again every every anthology project i've done i approach differently because each anthology requires something different but the example of the big books they're all reprint anthologies so in those sense they have a much broader wider theme science fiction weird fiction fantasy fiction so in those cases um and what's really interesting is that all the anthologies that i've done we have a um we put together a pitch paper to go to go to the publisher we're pitching the project and we have these ideas of what it's going to be and who's going to be included and what we're going to focus on this and that and the other and what's interesting is that after the project is done I will often go back to that pitch paper to see how close I am to what I said I was going to do and I always veer and I know that's going to happen but but I want to know going in that I have a general idea and um, what Jeff and I often do is we'll have like a general idea and then we start having conversations. And we most of the time have these conversations while we hike, which is very interesting too, because when you're out in the wilderness and you're hiking, there are no distractions. There's no phone ringing, there's no TV, there's no cat that needs to be fed. So it gives us an opportunity to really talk through a lot of things. And then he always brings paper and pen, so he'll jot down notes and things like that. But, but all the projects that I've ever done, I always try to seek out new voices. That's just been a thing for me. And I also have a passion for translated fiction. So those things I do in almost every single project I've ever done. I haven't always been successful in that, but that's been a goal. The thing about doing a reprint anthology, if you have works that are new in translation, it's almost like having something new in the anthology and not just a reprint. So I like being able to do that as well. But every, again, every, every project has a different idea. When, when um, I did the steampunk anthologies, of course, that has its own view. But even with the steampunk, I tried to push on those boundaries as well and make sure that I was looking at steampunk from all different kinds of perspectives. And so um, I went to it in that direction. And again, I had some tried and true names, the people you expect. Then I had some people you never would have expected. And even in the um, the third steampunk anthology that I did, I had some new fiction, which was interesting too, because all the previous ones had been um, reprints. So every project, a completely different approach. I don't know if we've lost Marita there. Yeah, I don't know. We may have done. Okay, so I'm gonna channel uh, David Hartwell, who I used to sit and chat to a lot at Dick for. So when he talked about putting together anthologies, he talked about the marketability and the need to have big names on the front, that you needed to have those headliners in order to actually sell the anthology, both mm -hmm. to the publisher and to the audience. And then he talked quite a lot about the structure of the anthology and where he placed stories and talked about bookending. So that you had those big names at the beginning and at the end and in the middle. And that within those three points, you could then structure the lesser known names so that as somebody left a big name, they moved, they, they were drawn into the next story. And I thought that was quite interesting. But you were also talking about different types of anthologies. And I just, I made a few notes beforehand, and I'm sure you'll want to add to this, because there are different types. There's the year's best anthology, where the message you are trying to say is, these are the absolute best stories, and you sure have to actually prove it. There's the theme, and uh, sorry, the new voices anthology. Um, and the ones I actually wrote down here that I loved at the time I read them, Narlo Hopkinson's Whispers to the Cotton Tree Root, um, Sherry Thomas's Dark Water, a mm -hmm. new one that's absolutely sweeping the awards in the short story category. Zelda Knight 
Dominion, an anthology of speculative fiction from the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. Most anthologies get one or two stories into the awards list, if they, if anything at all. Something like three, or, three to five of the stories in that anthology have been picked up on various award lists. So I really recommend that one. And then the ones that introduce us to different countries, Johannes Nasalo's It Came From The North, which is Finnish SF, Ken Liu, have I said that right? Invisible Planets, which is Chinese SF in translation, which I thought were really interesting. Um, and then the, the, there are the anthologies where you're trying to make a point. And I don't know what order they were produced in, but that set of anthologies from, and I'll get this right in a second. So the, the various people destroy science fiction from light speed, mm -hmm. uh, which were great fun. So there's all sorts of different things you might want to try and achieve with an anthology. And the same, to be honest, is true with the critical nonfiction, where you may have, it comes back to the assignment I suggested, when you edit an anthology, you're telling a story about the field. Mm -hmm. And that, that may be historical, that may be a big story, it may be a sliver of a story, but the stories, the stories don't just stand alone. They're part of a, a critical narrative. And it's worth bearing in mind, we as a field use anthologies far more than other fields do. I'm not saying they don't exist. There's plenty of collections of romance stories. There's collections of crime stories. But that idea of the anthology is kind of the heart of the genre isn't there in other genres. So I, I do think there's something different going on in our field that shapes how anthologies are then edited. I do want to mention one thing though, that an animal probably not sagely here. They're a lot harder to sell than they once were and you don't tend to find them in bookshops. No, that's when true. I, yeah, when I was a kid, I walked into Forbidden Planet or I forgot the um, Rog Payton's shop in Birmingham and there'd be loads of anthologies to buy from. Now you kind of have to know they exist and that's a real shame was a um, thing that I noticed as I was sort of doing my own background reading for this is that I specifically went out and looked at anthologies published in, in the past year and I, I tend to think that I, you know, I keep my nose on the ground, I'm sort of following what's, what's being published and there were so many things that I completely missed uh, and, you know, I felt, felt really bad about it. <laughs> And there's something else you can do with anthologies, and this is both a good and a bad thing, and I'll talk about why it's a good thing first. You can trace friendship groups. Mm. You can actually, oh, let's use a different word, let's talk affinity groups. I particularly noticed this in the early 2000s when I started to notice that certain anthologies, it's not that they had exactly the same names, but you could kind of trace the shift of the affinity group. You can do it with the new wave writers. I once had a very, very funny conversation at ICFA. Somebody gave one of those absolutely brilliant, totally wrong papers about the connections between new wave writers. And afterwards, I, I went up to him and said, it's a lovely paper, but please let me introduce you to John Clute, who can explain who was sleeping with whom. Um, <laughs> because they'd come up with this incredibly complex reason as to why these writers were working together, which it was so much simpler than that. It's and just, I'm not good saying that that's yeah. what's going on in these other anthologies. But I realised, because I was going to a lot of conventions at the time, that I could see the contents pages of these anthologies hanging out in the bar together. Now, why is this a bad thing? because you were getting 10 stories by men and one by the woman they liked having drinks with. And it was about the time people started to say, what is going on here? And it's something that those of us who program convention items realized we were doing as well. We were saying, X wants to be on this panel, who does he get on with? So we were putting his mates on rather than thinking X wants to be on this panel, who else knows a lot about this topic? And you could see it in the anthologies. Oh, somebody said, that, and they were almost all the same ethnicity. They were white. It was white blokes. And you could see it in the bars. 
and they turned up in these collections together. So I think there's been a lot of pushback against that, um, a lot of hard and tough push pushback. Um, somebody saying the, it, <laughs> the secrets of the indie anthology. I don't even think they were necessarily all indie, but it was very noticeable. And I don't think now you can, op I don't think you can now open up anthologies and see the same thing in quite the same way. And that's because a lot of work has been done. Somebody says it happens in academia too, absolutely. Um, a lot of work's been done about not saying we won't use white men, but saying, what were the things we did that got us to that position? How can we use a different way of selecting stories, attracting writers, making us a look different? Um, Actually, I can give you a very good example. For many years, Interzone almost never published women. And it was because the editor had got a reputation of never publishing women. Jeff Ryman did one guest issue and it was 50-50. No problem at all. Not because he chose more women, but because more women sent stories in because Jeff Ryman was publishing it. Does that make sense? Yes. And, 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 and that's yeah. really an important point, what you're talking about there. It's a matter of who the gatekeepers are. Exactly. And I think that what we're seeing today is a wider variety and a larger number of gatekeepers when back in the 90s, there was maybe two or three gatekeepers. Yeah. And if a particular gatekeeper didn't like your work, you, you were screwed. Out. But now there's so many venues. There's so many different venues and, there, and, and we actually need to, it's not just looking for the diversity in the writers, but we need to have the diversity in the publishers and the editors as well because that's how you're going to get into the wider world. Those writers that you could, those editors that were publishing the same names all, always, in some cases, it could have just been a case of laziness. These are easy stories for me yeah. to get because these are all my buddies. And I know I can count on them to send me something. You know, it's easy, easy pickings. It is a lot harder to have open reading periods, yeah. to look at recommendations, to reach out, to, to see what else is going on in the world. It takes a lot more time and energy to do that. And, and also to turn your an mates anthology, down. <laughs> the money in the anthology is not really great for an editor, mm -hmm. if it even is it, exists, you know. But also to turn your mates down. Yeah. So I, I don't think people who don't work in some kind of editing know just how difficult it can be to yes. turn people down. So my route into editing was almost accidental. I was meant to be the junior editor on the Cambridge Companion to Science Fiction. I mean, my best beloved who is watching this hates writing rejection letters, hates it. Whereas I don't mind at all. Not one little bit. <laughs> And I look at some collections and think that was your mate and you didn't know how to say no. Um, and I think mm. that's quite a bit of it. Uh, but I, what was around? Was it with the Mammoth Book of Science Fiction edited by well-known name, the guy who did all the Mammoth ones? And I think there were no women in at all, which was quite impressive. Right. And I, th I think that was I the point which people really lost. I can't yeah, remember. I can't. People really lost patience at that point. It's like you have to be kidding us. Um, but it uh, see, it also goes back to the whole structures of science fiction conventions. All the problem with science fiction and fantasy is that all the things that make us a fabulous field are our Achilles heel. The fact that people become well-known fans, become well-known writers, they're committed to the field, are generous, therefore we want to, all of that ties us into structures that we don't often question enough. You know, mm -hmm. we don't question why should somebody should do X type of service, why should somebody should have to go to the bar to make contacts. We take all these things for granted and I think people like Anne and Jeff who genuinely go out and actively look people get to know who the editors are who actively go out and look so but, but we do have um, to challenge a lot of our givens about our internal structures yes so we've talked a lot about oh so sort of can i just say concept. somebody's given us the name mike ashley yes so we've talked a lot about how not uh to do an anthology and uh, we have a question from Paul uh, that is actually about how to do an apology. And it's, what would be your number one piece of advice uh, for someone 
putting together an anthology, obviously taking in mind that every project is going to be different. But what is the thing that, that sort of transfers across projects? Well, to me, it's the same advice that I would give to a writer is trust your instincts. Don't second guess yourself. Um, a lot of times you have an idea of what you want to do and then you start having a lot of people telling you what you're supposed to be doing and then you veer off into something that's not your passion. You know, as, a, as an anthologist, as an editor, just you need to trust your instincts because you're doing what you're doing because people trust you. So if they're trusting you to make the right decisions, you just need to, to, to do that. And when I was talking before about um, putting together those proposals and then later on going back and like they're not the same anymore, that's going to happen and that's okay. You might have an idea of what you think your anthology is going to be in the beginning, but let it take you where, let, let the book be what it's going to be. You need to let those creative juices flow from you and let that book form itself, even if it's going to be a little bit different than what you originally thought it would be. The same thing it would be for a writer. Writer might have an idea what a story is and then it just kind of changes. Yeah, no, so, I absolutely, absolutely agree. Sorry, I'd like sorry. to come at this from a completely different angle which is actually from my experience with academic presses and anybody in here who's an academic now knows exactly what I'm going to say. The publishing world has changed dramatically. You don't need a publisher to produce an anthology. You can use online publishing, you can produce um, stuff for Kindle, for eBooks, you can do print on demand. What's happened in the field, as Anne alluded to, is it narrowed right down when people were having huge problems finding publishers for anthologies. We are now in a position where as long as you don't want hard copy in the shops, which frankly you aren't going to get anyway, you can actually publish an anthology relatively cheaply. You can use Kickstarter to, use a, to create a form of subscription publishing that would have been familiar to anybody in the 18th century. You can get the money up front to pay your authors because you should pay. Do not ask people to work for free. Mm -hmm. Make sure you pay your copy editor. Make sure you pay your editor, your layout person, but do it through subscription publishing. And if you want to go out and edit anthologies, we are now in a period where you can do that, where that would not have been true 20 years ago. Do it. The more, as Anna's just said, the more gatekeepers we have, the more gates we have. That's right. Because, you know, gatekeepers keep gates. Open those gates for people. There's so much room in the field for more editors, both for subscription magazines, for subscription anthologies. It's doable. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, we have one more question uh, from Ruth, uh, which is uh, a bit more, more general and sort of uh, an invitation to discuss uh, current, current times. Uh, so um, Ruth says, uh, I've been to a lot of recent authors events where how are you coping with writing in the pandemic has come up. But I've not seen this asked of anthologists or academics. So same question, uh, how has the pandemic affected uh, your own work? My answer is terribly short. I had the year from hell last year and it had nothing to do with the pandemic. I had three surgeries and COVID twice. I wrote five, two short 1,000 word pieces last week. And that's the first writing I have done since March, 2020. But I, I effectively slept through most of the pandemic. I missed it. I don't well. think. Of all the things to do through the pandemic, sleeping through it is. <laughs> yeah, mostly on morphine, it should be said. Morphine is wonderful, by the way. Morphine is amazing. <laughs> There but we go, me, that's the piece of advice from this event, guys. <laughs> for me, it wasn't just the pandemic. It, we also, here in the States, we're dealing with um, the election and the insurrection and all that. I mean, all these gray hairs you see right here, January 7th, I woke up completely gray. Um, I, I actually had to be very careful about my state of mind when I sat down to read a new piece of fiction that a writer sent to me because I felt that it was my responsibility to the writer to have the right state of mind when I sat down to read. So I didn't read nearly as much as I would have because I seemed to always be stressed 
or worried or anxious or depressed or any of those feelings. And I don't want to be in that state of mind when I'm reading somebody's fiction because it would, it, it was difficult. My eyes would just fall off the page. So I did spend a lot of time reading stupid stuff for fun, you know, just to kind of, you know, um, and as far as fiction, there, there, it, there, there were stories that I was able to connect with that I acquired for tour.com, which you will be seeing coming out in the next several months and some that have already come out. But um, as far as anthologies are concerned, um, I had an anthology come out right at the beginning of the shutdown. It came out March 16th called Avatars, Inc. It was all original fiction, science fiction. And um, so I spent the first couple of months of the shutdown of the pandemic doing PR online. I was doing radio shows, I was doing interviews, I was doing, so I was like totally wrapped up doing that and not even thinking about everything else that was going on. So when that died away, then it was like all the stuff kind of hit me. And so I just had to not even do anything for a while. I have heard from so many of my writer friends about them feeling like they can't do anything, but now that they're shut down, they should be able to be productive and this and that and the other. And the only thing I can say is don't beat yourself up for what you can't do because everyone's going through that. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to be massively productive and get a lot of stuff done. I will tell you this, my house is clean. My house is clean. Okay. Okay. And I keep finding new things to clean in my house. It seems to be comforting to me. I don't know why, but. And there has been a gender a difference. Thing. We know there's been a gender difference. In academia, in the first six months of the lockdown, men's submissions to journals went up and women's went down. Mm. Um, now that evened out later on, but it was very noticeable at first. But. So years ago, there was a, a convention in Britain, which the program just wasn't very well put together. And that was when we all discovered that we all needed program not to go to. We needed program that we didn't go to, if that made sense, in order to talk mm -hmm. about the program we didn't go to. And I think a lot of people who are, who are introverts, who thought they'd be absolutely fine, have discovered that part of being an introvert is deciding not to go do things. And now we can't decide not to go do things because those things aren't there. Almost as frustrated as the extroverts who would have gone to them because we that exist is. in tension with the world around us. I mean, people ask me what I want to do when lockdown is over. And I want to go out for a cup of coffee in Starbucks, you know, <laughs> that's what I want to do. How could that have become so big? But I'm aware of the events I wouldn't have gone to that aren't happening, but were still part of my calendar mm -hmm. and part of the structure of my world. So I think it's that. It, it's that thing that, well, any writer who's ever gone full time knows, or any academic who's gone on sabbatical knows, you thought you were going to do so much and you spent the first month sorting your desk. You know? mm -hmm. We, we, we most, not everybody, but most of us need the constraints of the day job and the activity and the taking the kids to work or, or whatever. I mean, we got a dog in January, partially a lockdown dog, but partially because I've wanted a dog forever. Um, and the constraints she places on my working day have probably been better for my mental health as I go, because I've been in recovery. I, I swear, folks, I've done rehab three times in 12 months, three times. Mm. But having the structure around it of having to walk the dog and suddenly I'm starting to write again. And I think the two are connected. The, the structure matters. Yes, yeah, somebody's saying boundaries are good. Oh, I, agree, I agree with you. <laughs> I, yeah. I had to put together a daily routine to, to be able to deal with this, you know, like, and I, I'm sorry, it is a cleaning routine, but on Mondays I clean the kitchen and on Tuesdays, I, you know, Sorry. just to have the routine. Oh, no, there, there was one period when I was recovering from COVID where I basically spent a month on the sofa. But what I did as I got better is created a routine and you'll all love this one. First, I read nonfiction. Then I read a proper fiction book. And then I read a fun, lighthearted fiction book. <laughs> that was my day because I couldn't get off the sofa. But just having the routine of I know what kind of thing I'm going to be reading and I am going to start with the tough stuff and work down, not down, down is the wrong word, and work towards the lighter. 
actually help me stay sane. Mm -hmm. So I like that um, idea. on that recommendation, uh, I'm going to ask a last question and then close us off. Uh, a, because we, we're um, at about an hour and 20 minutes since we started, uh, but also because uh, speaking of the routine, I do need my, my new dose of paracetamol because I'm starting to sort of see, bla <laughs> see blares <laughs> instead of people. Um, so the last question is uh, a short one from Meg. If uh, each of you can recommend uh, an anthology that we should read just now, just something that comes into your head. Uh, again, big books aside, I'm assuming everyone's reading uh, the big books just slowly. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'll have to be honest with you. Um, I haven't been reading any anthologies since my last one came out because I just had to put all that stuff aside. I've been reading a lot of, um, I guess you would call it crime fiction, detective fiction. That's kind of like my comfort zone. I don't know why it is, but that's what I read a lot of when I'm stressed. So I've been reading that. And I'm also reading um, some more um, memoirs, books like that. Um, memoirs written by women. Um, there was one memoir that I read recently called Burn, Burn This House Down by a Female Chef. And her book was amazing. And I, I read um, Samantha Irby's um, Sorry, No Thank You, I think was the name of hers. And um, J.M. Brammer's new memoir, which is coming out, I think later this summer, I read that as well. So I've been reading things completely outside of my, my work because I kind of need that separation. You know, we're, we're still, I, I know things are starting to open up, but we're still in lockdown. I'm at, where I live in Tallahassee, our numbers are still going up and our governor is an idiot. So I'm still very stressed, even though I'm fully vaxxed, but you know. No, I, I completely understand. I mean, sort of uh, any across all time, if you have a favorite that you'd like to recommend, if there's something that you think people should read. Uh, I know you guys both mentioned some um, earlier. Yeah, just if there's anything. This is the book I was telling you about that I read to my grandson. Yes. I can't tell you enough good things about this book and I read it several months ago, but it's still in my head. You don't need to tell me any good things about it. I reread it when I need to feel better. Uh, so there we go, big recommendation, uh, House of the Cerulean Sea. Uh, what about you, Farah? Do you have any anthologies or any other um, work that you'd like to recommend? I'm going to mention the one I mentioned earlier, which I just think is astonishingly good. Astonishing in the sense that it's not that often you get quite this many good stories in something. Zelda Knight, Dominion, an anthology of speculative fiction from the African diaspora. And the book I read this week, which is Catherine Languishes, let me get this right, from spare um to ward robe, which is really interesting because she tries to recapitulate her childhood reading of the Narnia books while inter interleaving with it both her adult critique of the racism, sexism, and various other problems, and unpacking some of the things that Lewis was doing that she'd not understood, which is all the Spencerian references and his alchemical references and all of those. Um, thank you, somebody's put the link up. And that was absolutely fascinating. And I'm just trying to think. So <laughs> I spent the last three years reading fiction about the English Civil War. And that came out of a book I'm actually writing on an author called Jeffrey Trees. And I've just come full circle because I'm reading his nonfiction and I'm reading his book on the Duke of Newcastle, William Cavendish. Who is, this is one of those where the person he thought was famous is not the person we thought was famous because this is the husband of Margaret Cavendish who wrote The Blazing World. So I'm loving rereading this book because I've, I've just spent three years writing about the English Civil War, and because it's Geoffrey Trees, and because it's partially about William Cavendish, and it's going to be a bit about Margaret Cavendish. So nobody has to go read that, but I have loved that. So I think my two recommendations, though, are the Dominion Anthology and Catherine Languish's new book, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Oh, and one other, which came out last year, Kathleen Jennings, who Fly is, away. Yes, and the reason I want to recommend that 
is right at the beginning, I talked about there being a difference between what you can do at short story length and what you can do at novel length. And Fly Away is a very rare or relatively rare example of a, a mode of fantasy that you usually only see at short story length, but which she successfully pulled off at novel length. And normally we're talking about people like John Crowley, M. John Harris, and Elizabeth Hand. It's a small select group that can produce that kind of uneasy, weird fiction at novel length. So I would recommend that very highly. Perfect. Um, thank so you. thank you both very much uh, for coming here and for being uh, amazing, uh, just amazing panelists in general and putting up with my uh, <laughs> troubling internet connection. Um, so just some quick housekeeping because before I let everyone go. Uh, so our Glasgow and 2024 book group is going to be kicking off at Balticon. Uh, that is a free online convention at 6 p.m. on Saturday, May 19th. And we are reading uh, the queer anthology Silk and Steel, um, which I personally love, so I hope you'll all enjoy as well. Uh, there may be a June event, but that is still forming. So follow us on Twitter, keep abreast on our social media, and we'll let you know as soon as we um, have those details. And generally, there will be some interesting pride activity on all of our social channels and blog. So remember to tune in. Uh, and then on the 21st of July, we have an event with Angry Robot where we'll be chatting with Cameron Johnston, Stephen, Stephen Arian about their brilliant new novels, uh, The Malefic Maleficent, oh, English, I speak it, uh, Maleficent Seven and uh, Stephen the Coward. And uh, finally, uh, reminding to everyone, uh, we have our spring and summer campaign. So if you support us during this time or upgrade your support, uh, you get a postcard with the amazing Glasgow Green Woman art uh, by BFSA, award-winning artist Ian Clark, and access to exclusive supporter digital swag, uh, which you know, don't want to miss. And just generally keep your eyes open for our so on our social media for amazing uh, make excitement opportunities. Come and see us at Chimera and at Punctuation Con in June. And yeah, basically, if you enjoy what we do, um, we welcome volunteers, we welcome support, and we'd be glad to have you in any way that you'd like to join us. Uh, and that is everything from me. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, have a lovely evening. And uh, goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. I thank it. you both. Good questions. Good discussion. Great.